I got 21 in the chat. Okay, hey, welcome. Um, so hopefully everybody can still hear me well. Um, I think I got the microphone issues worked out. So um, um, like I said, uh, so we'll get started here. Uh, so this is our 540 class computer architecture. Um, I don't have anybody face to face and that's fine. Um, I'm in the classroom, so I'm, I'm gonna um, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do uh, face to face if, if people want or need it. Uh, but um, let me go ahead and share my screen and, and so I can get up the syllabus and talk a little bit about that. Um, Go, close that off. Um, so my goals today, um, you know, so I was gonna spend, you know, the usual kind of 15 minutes or so, uh, maybe not too long, uh, talk a little bit about what the class is gonna be about, the assignments, you know, that kind of stuff, technical stuff. So we'll start with that. Um, so hopefully everybody, I saw that there were still a few people who hadn't taken the first quiz. So, uh, so I'm jumping ahead. So let me go and bring up the syllabus and then we'll talk about, um, talk about the um, um, course structure and assignments and things like that. So, um, so first of all, if, if you haven't gotten into MyLeo online, well, if you haven't gotten into MyLeo online, I'm not certain how you knew about the Zoom session, but um, so uh, you do need to get into the D2L system for our computer architecture class. You, you need to be checking this regularly. So, you know, I'll, I'll probably be posting um, announcements and, you know, solutions and things like that. Um, you know, all of the assignments should have and activities should have dates associated with them. So you should be able to, to use the calendar functions and things like that. Um, I usually use the content personally to, to kind of browse through all the, the things, activities and things that are going on on the course. Um, so in particular, um, the overview here, I'll start with that. Um, this has a copy of the syllabus that you should probably take a look at at least. Um, so this is a computer architecture. Um, the computer organization and architecture. Um, the the so I mean our, our topics of this course is we're looking at sort of the hardware level of computers a bit, so, so about computer architecture. So, so the level below the operating system here. So this, this is kind of a good course, um, kind of a companion to the operating systems course. We have both of those as required core courses uh, for our uh, degree program, right? So, uh, I mean, personally, I, I think it would actually be better if you took this course first. Um, I, I've argued in the past to try to make it a prerequisite, but, but we try not to have too many prerequisites so that, you know, people have a little bit more flexibility on their schedule and things. Um, but, but yeah, if, if, if you haven't taken operating systems before or, or yet, um, this is a, that, that's great. So you can do this course first. You know, you might want to keep in mind. So we actually do touch on the beginnings of, of kind of where you start with operating systems here, right? If you've already taken operating systems, you know, you might want to, uh, th this might fill in some of the blanks. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the hardware mechanisms that support operating systems, you know, memory protection, things like that, um, and, and, and stuff down at, at the, the hardware level, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we do in this course, you know, I, but my, our main goals are that you are able to understand kind of the costs and the benefits of, of different approaches to implementing things in a computing system. Um, so, so the different trade-offs that happen when you, you know, organize hardware um, different ways or, or you, you know, uh, implement an algorithm um, at, at the hardware level or at any level, different ways. So, um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, we'll get, we'll get down and talk about, you know, caching, memory organization, um, uh, things like cache strategies, so, so some of the algorithms that work for caching. Uh, we'll talk about 
the CPU, some some of the things, uh, some some of the details of of uh, down to we'll talk a little bit about circuit logic, circuit logic design, um, and then kind of the implementation of arithmetic logic units, stuff like that, pipelining things like that. Um, our textbook that we use, uh, nobody here. Uh, um, in class here, but um, um, our required one is the Stallings. I got a copy of it here. Um, I'm using the 11th edition of the textbook, and all of the uh, page numbers or chapter numbers that I give for the assignments and, and things refer to the, the 11th edition chapter numbers and, and page numbers and figure numbers and things. You're probably fine if you have an older version. I think, I think 11 is the most recent. I don't, I don't think there's a 12th edition out. So this Stallings guy is a kind of a textbook manufacturer and he kind of makes his living off of doing different versions of, of the textbook. Um, there are lots of different ways to obtain the textbook, you know, but, you know, of course you can get it in our campus bookstore, but um, um, there's many other ways. So if you need the textbook, um, let me know. Hopefully everybody's gotten that before now. You, you will really need it for this class. You'll need to do the readings. I mean, um, all the activities are really kind of coming from this textbook. So it's going to be important that you that you have a copy of it. Um, I don't know. I mean, eighth edition might be okay. I would recommend like ninth or tenth at least or eleventh if you can get it. Um, Feel free to um, you know call out questions. Um, I've got the chat up, or you know unmute your mic um, and uh, ask a question if you want to at any time. So, um, I mean these sessions. I, I think I talked a little bit about it in my um, uh, announcement. So yeah, I really don't mean these are our official class meeting times. I'm not going to be doing like tr traditional lectures on these. So uh, I'm gonna be more going over like problems. So, so we'll go over past solutions and things to assignments that we have, um, or I might work out problems in class here, um, things like that. So, so that's mostly what I want to, to do with these sessions. So for the most part, you know, you're gonna be responsible for reading the materials, doing the quizzes, doing the assignments, um, and then um, coming to these, classes or asking um, asynchronously through email, you know, when you have questions about materials and things. So. Um, so I actually haven't posted official office hours yet. I'm probably going to have office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays, like probably from like nine to 12 or something like that. So, um, but, you know, again, because of the continuing COVID system, um, I do prefer that you, you know, ask over email first and, and, and uh, I'm fine, you know, setting up a face to face appointment if, if you need it. Uh, but, but yeah, try and resolve stuff through email first um, and or we can also set up a Zoom meeting if that's fine with people first. Um, but um, 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 I'm fine, you know, to also contact on, on, on office hours or face to face if you need an appointment. But it's always best even if when I do post some office hours to uh, email and set up an appointment because uh, so, so for Eaton, I'm not talking even just about myself. So all of us, even though we have office hours, I mean, I often get pulled away or have something else happening um, during that time. So, so it may, may or may not be around even during posted office hours. So. Um, okay, so most people, uh, of course, are interested in the, um, the assessments and the evaluations. Um, I've, I've kept the assessments relatively simple on this class, um, although there are quite a few of them, all right? So 540 is a core course, as already mentioned. So um, I've kind of landed on making the assignments that we do and some and the questions in the exam to be kind of practice for the comprehensive exam. So since this is a core course, you have to pass a question um, when you take the, the comprehensive exam near the end of our degree program um, from uh, computer architecture. So most all of the written assignments and test questions and things um, 
are going to be kind of similar to questions you might see on the comprehensive exam in general, but also specifically the types of questions you might get for um, the computer architecture um, uh, questions on the comprehensive exam. So uh, when I last checked, there were at least six or seven people that hadn't done the quiz yet. So, um, you know, if you're just re realizing that you're maybe not checking the, the site, the, you know, our DTOL site frequently enough. Um, so the, the, there's gonna be a quiz each week and an assignment each week, basically. Um, the quizzes are, are meant to be relatively low pressure. Okay, so, so there's gonna be like 14 quizzes, one for each of our weeks or one for each of our units. So each individual quiz is only worth about a little over 1%, uh, less than one and a half percentage points total for the class. So, you know, so I'm hoping, I mean, it is, it, I mean, they are open book, open notes, you know, but I, I'm hoping that you're not going out there and finding like, uh, you might be able to find um, like a, an answer to these quiz test banks that I use for the quizzes. Um, or you might be able to work in groups, um, you know, uh, I mean, if I detect that or catch that, I mean, of course, I'm going to fail you and possibly get disciplinary actions, you know, so the quizzes and assignments and things are supposed to be individual assignments in this class. But um, so what I'm getting at, though, is that, that the quizzes are supposed to be low pressure. So what you're supposed to do for those is do the readings on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then use the quiz as sort of a self-assessment of whether you're really getting the basics, okay? So the, the quizzes are just multiple choice, uh, true, false kinds of questions, fill in the blank questions. So, so they're, they're not meant to be like practice for the uh, comprehensive exam. They're, they're meant more for self-assessment, right? So, um, and, and I made them do before our class meeting when I'll actually talk about the material for the unit that week, because I want you to read the, the textbook first before you kind of come to these classes and do sort of the self-assessment for the quiz. Um, so that, you know, one, you know, so that when we do have these meetings, um, um, if you're participating in them, that you'll come in with questions and come on with a little bit of preparation, right? So it's study after study shows that, just sitting here listening to stuff, people just don't really, that, that, that does not help for you to understand and comprehend the material, right? So, so, so it's better if, if you do the stuff beforehand, you know, your own self-learning, and then you come in with questions, so stuff you didn't understand, you know? So if you did, did bad on a, on a quiz question or didn't understand it, or you wanna talk more about something um, for the material, for the unit, um, that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, try and come to these interactively or, you know, ask me questions over email or, or whatever, so. All right, so that's the quizzes. Um, and there's gonna be an assignment each week. So, so um, these are worth twice as much as the quizzes. Um, so they, they end up being worth about, still, still there's not a lot since, each individual one, since there's like 14 of these assignments that you have to do, each individual one is only worth like three percentage, actually a little bit less than three percentage points total for, for your, for the class, right? Um, but the, these are basically kind of questions from our textbook, uh, from, from the questions at the end of the chapters on the textbook. But these are pretty, these are what we normally use or other sources, but the same kinds of things for comprehensive exam questions, right? So, so you should think of these as uh, your first step at, at practicing um, the types of written questions that you would see on our comprehensive exam um, um, for our degree program, all right? And I'm gonna talk about our first assignment here today, right? Uh, actually, I'll talk about our first quiz here too. Um, I'll, I'll show it real quickly. And then there are going to be two exams, a midterm exam and a final exam, which is going to be comprehensive. So the final exam, um, any material that we cover, uh, there might be questions on it, but I probably will emphasize the material in the second half of the course that we cover since the midterm exam. 
Um, and again, although probably on those exams, I might have some uh, kind of warm up, true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank questions. But the real important things in, on the mid uh, on those exams will be the, there'll be two questions or two or three questions that are meant to be written response questions again that are like comprehensive exam questions and the, the the exams will be timed although we will take those online so so sometimes when I do this course uh, I, I never I never usually have um, attendance requirements anyway for courses like this even if they're face to face but sometimes I do do the, the exams in class um, so you would be required at least to come in for the exams to do those but again for the continuing COVID situation I'm not going to do that um, the, the, the exams also will be uh, given uh, on my Leo online, but they will be timed. So it'll be like a two hour time limit. Um, actually, there might be a little bit less. So for the, the, the comprehensive exam, um, so I, I, I keep probably mixing, uh, I meant our exam, our final exam and midterm exam, right? So comprehensive exam questions also, last, comprehensive exams last for approximately like two hours. Uh, but and, and um, so you have to answer like five questions on the comprehensive exam, uh, and, and we we expect about twenty minutes for each question. So so actually usually we have a time limit like a hundred minutes or something like that. So an hour and forty minutes uh, is typical. So um, I'll probably give you know like a full two hours for the midterm and final exam for this class. So you might have more time than you typically would for a comprehensive exam question, but you know. Uh, they are meant to be a little bit, of course, they are assessments for this class, and they are, though, to, to try and help you prepare um, for the comprehensive exam. Yeah. All right, um, so that, that's all, uh, all the stuff I have for the assessments here. Any, any kind of quick questions um, on that stuff? My audio is still clear, right? Give me a thumbs up or something if everybody's hearing me and doesn't want to ask a question in the chat or something. All right. Um. Couple thumbs up. All right, thanks. I'll go ahead and move on. But yeah, feel free to uh, shout out a question. You got class syndrome? Yes, yes, we got a class. What time? Start? Oh, I'm, I've started already. We're zooming. Um, so, I'm sorry. so, um, so yeah, let's talk about the quizzes and the assignments and things. Um, or let's look at those real quickly. So, so you can get all the assessments here. Uh, all the, the the materials and things um, under the content. Um, um, uh, I don't have any, too much on additional materials. I, there might be more stuff on there. Um, I'll put the links to. Um, I, I'll make a a, a a YouTube playlist. Um, and I did begin recording this, didn't I? Let me check that I'm recording here. Yeah, so we're recording. So I'll, I'll record all these sessions, um, you know, even if, we, even if we do have people here face to face live, I'll still always do Zoom um, sessions for these and record these and post these as well. Um, so and, I, and, and once once I get the first one up here, I, there'll, there'll be a YouTube uh, link and I'll put that on there. I'll, I'll try and get some more uh, materials on here as well. So um, some of the stuff I'm going to use for our meeting kind of come from the textbook here. So, so you'll be able to find some of those materials here, some simulations and, and things um, that kind of come from stallings in this textbook here. We'll talk about those or use those and for some of these units. So. Um, so yeah, each unit, so, so our, our first week we're covering actually two chapters. Usually we'll cover about one chapter, sometimes two chapters uh, in a week here. So for the first unit, um, you needed to go over the, the introductory chapter one. And I skipped to chapter 10 because um, 
you know, chapter 10 is about number systems. Uh, that chapter out of all the chapters in her textbook is stuff that I really think that um, um, as a graduate student, you, you should have been familiar with already. I mean, um, if, if you haven't seen, uh, you know, converting between different bases and stuff like that, you know, it's okay, but but, but yeah, you better uh, pay extra attention to that chapter and make certain you understand the concepts. And, and even if you have seen the stuff in the past, hopefully you reviewed the things. So. Um, I'll talk more about that. So most of the questions on the first written assignment are, are about converting um, between different bases, you know, doing, using binary and decimal and hexadecimal number systems and things. Um, so, so as already, so the, the assignments will always be due on the Friday um, at the end of the week, at the end of the unit. So this first one is due Friday. Um, I've made the deadline by 5 p.m. So, be, so make a note of that um, for the assignments because I don't know, I, I really don't like making it midnight. And uh, because when I do that, everybody waits till late Friday night. And I encourage people to, to, to not be doing working, you know, all, all on your Friday evenings, right? So, so anyway, um, um, 5 p.m. on Friday for the assignments. Um, I'll probably usually try and spot check that and, you know, give a reminder to anybody that hasn't turned it in by 5 p.m. And, and also maybe spot check that you submitted it to the right submission folder. And it looks like I can at least open it up, although um, I, I probably myself, I probably won't usually begin grading them um, after 5 p.m., but maybe a little later. So. Um, and then there's a quiz due for each unit as well, but that is due by Wednesday, um, and that will be due by 7 p.m. So it's just so so you have a due date on that just before we have these scheduled um, uh, uh, class meetings. All right. So again, I already talked about why I did that. You know, to to try and encourage you to do the readings before our class um, 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 so you can uh, self-assess and take the quiz here. Um, let me look real quickly at the quiz one here. Um, so I don't know if quite everybody has taken it yet, but, I, but yeah, a few more did. So hopefully most of those six or seven people that hadn't taken it when I looked about an hour ago did manage to see that, or we're just waiting to the last minute to do that. So. Um, so, oh, the uh, the, the quizzes. Um, there is um, a couple of things I wanted to mention about these. So the. Um, the fill in the blank questions on the quizzes um, that they, they are set up to try and auto grade them, but um, you know if 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 you typed it slightly differently from the expected answer, um, it won't auto grade it correctly, right? So some people some people probably saw that, or you might you might have thought that you got that question right, um, um, but uh, you weren't getting all the points that you thought. So. Um, uh, you probably can't see feedback. Um, so, so I've set it up so you can see more detailed feedback, but not until uh, after the quiz um, is due. So not until like tomorrow morning, I think. So you should review these quiz questions. Um, I, I have to go in and kind of check those written um, fill in the blank questions by hand uh, just because, uh, you know, that the, the auto grader um, you know, like, like if something is capitalized and it's expected not to be capitalized, it won't get it. Or, or you might have, have have said something using two words when, when you know, um, the auto grader had it just as a one word answer, but it was still fundamentally correct. All right. So, so what I'm saying is, is um, um, you might actually have gotten one or two more extra points. So, so there'll usually be two or three of those fill in the blank questions, right? Um, and as the people that took the quiz probably discovered, I am giving three chances. So if you, if you didn't get a, a perfect score, um, 
Uh, it might it might have been that you actually did get a perfect score, but you know um, I had to hand grade uh, one or two of the and, and give a one or two points for some of the short answers. I, I hand graded already most of them, except for maybe ones that were submitted within the last hour or so. I'm, I maybe haven't looked at all of those yet. So. Um, and, and I am giving like actually three attempts. So you know if, if you don't get a hundred percent. And, and you think you might have had something wrong um, uh, instead of actually getting it right, but it just wasn't being graded correctly on like one of those short answer ones, you can always do another attempt. Right? So, and, and uh, you will be able to, on Thursday, uh, get more, look at a, um, a review, a quiz review. I encourage you to do that and check. Um, I mean, you know, because it could also be that I've mismarked like a true false or a multiple choice had the wrong answer in there, um, something like that. So always bring to my attention if there's something that you think might be wrong or not. I, I usually do look through these uh, summary of the question details um, and look for questions that, that lots of people were consistently uh, getting incorrect um, on things. So for example, we'll see if we can find one that had a lot, a big, uh, um, big issue here. So these are all the true false ones. Not unusual since since I have a big test bank and and you randomly only get three or four of these. Um, often there's only like each student will only four students or so will see each one of these questions at any given time, even for a class this size. So, um, so yeah, I mean the worst I saw was there's one with a forty percent. Um, Incorrect rate. So that was about the worst one I think I saw. A few with the uh, with one third of the respondents, but again, that's usually out of three or four people, so uh, that tends not to concern me too much. Um, so anyway, yeah. So I might look over these before our class and see if there's any that that were being consistently missed, which might be that that the answer was incorrect, or might be that that it's a question uh, or you know so a topic that we ought to maybe talk a little bit more about. So um, yeah, so for this one, um, for the two out of five people that missed this, uh, I'm not too certain why um, they were picking peripheral there. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So the system interconnect or the bus um, is the mechanism or the, the component uh, the, uh, of the four components that are talked about in our first chapter that provides the means for communication between the other the, the, the three main com other three components that were identified in chapter one the CPU the main memory and peripheral devices okay so really IO devices are another name for peripheral devices so you know so that's also another reason why that shouldn't you should have understood that that wasn't correct there so so it's, it's like saying that the a processor is a mechanism that provides communication between the CPU main memory and IO, but you know, processor and TPU are the same thing. Um, peripheral and CPU are the same, and, and, and IO are kind of the same thing there. Um, all right, I don't think I saw any question that really jumped out. There was one 50-50, but that was just only two students responded on that, so. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we talk about structure or we talk about function. So, so structure is the way that components are interrelated. Um, so I could, I could understand though, how somebody might have said, um, um, something else there. Um, these questions aren't always, you know, 100% obvious, and, and some of them might be have a little bit of opinion in there, um, you know, so, so, so um, but um, usually, uh, I, I pretty much agree with them. I've, I've looked over these on the test bank and stuff. So. All right, let, let's, let's move on. I'm kind of um, um, 
getting off topic there. Anybody have any questions about the quizzes or anything here? Um, sorry, I did have a question. So uh, yeah, I mean, all materials will be submitted through the, the, the um, our DTOL um, online here. So let me look at the assignment. So basically, um, I, I mean, um, I, you won't see exactly the same thing um, because when you're in as a student, uh, you won't quite see these. But, but yeah, if you go to an assignment, uh, like our assignment one here, um, um, so you'll just download this. But, but yeah, when, when you go to the, the assignment, um, there should be um, some text in there for you to upload your work basically for the assignment. So um, you can you can upload um, for the assignments, you can make uh, electronic documents. So you can use, um, you know, uh, Microsoft Word. So give me a .doc or .docx. Um, you can upload a PDF if you want. Um, you know, you could, you could use other stuff if you want, spreadsheets, most formats. I can, I can usually, if I, if I can't figure out how to open it up, um, I will ask you maybe to convert it or something, but, but go ahead, whatever you're using right now, um, and I'll tell you if I'm having some issues with it. So you can up, uh, and, and if you want to, you can, you know, write out your work longhand on paper. Um, if you do that, try and make certain that you scan it or take a picture of it um, and, and that it's legible, right? So, so if you are going to take pictures, um, um, uh, you know, make certain that, that you write neat enough so that I can read it. Um, and decipher it, um, and and, um, and then attach the pictures. And if you can be a, a uh, be helpful for me, if, if if you can try and avoid attaching uh, single images, if you have like lots of them, actually make a document for me. But um, but that's okay, you know. Like if you only have two or three pages, two or three images. Um, Yeah, so let's go over the the, the first written assignment. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, although, let me let me think. So I, I think I'm done kind of talking about um, um, technical things for the class. Hopefully, anybody have any questions about assignments and the structures of things? So we. Um, so yeah, like I said, we basically have uh, 14 units in total, broken up into five parts. Um, and we've basically got about like seven units before um, our midterm exam and then another seven units after that, right? And so that, um, and again, whenever I give, you know, chapter number readings and things, that's from, um, version 11 of the textbook. So those chapter numbers have changed. He inserted or moved them around a little bit, even on version 10, um, the 10th edition or 9th edition. So um, if you do have an older edition, you'll have to map um, kind of the, from, from the names of the chapters. And sometimes the, they're a chapter that, that we have in the 11th edition, um, you know, he, he might've taken two chapters and split that, or taken one chapter and split that into two. Right, so, so sometimes we have two separate chapters that might be like a single chapter in the like the. I think he did that for one of the chapters actually in the tenth edition. Um, uh, the chapter on caching and the chapter on memory, uh, the memory hierarchy used to be like a single chapter in the tenth edition, and it's not two chapters now um, in the eleventh edition. So anyway, just be aware of that. Um, all right, so um, usually I'm going to kind of go over, you know, instead of lecturing, go over like examples, of the assignments and stuff, although I, I think I might also bring up my notes and talk a little bit about those today, um, um, summarize, uh, but let, let's do the assignment first because I, I might not do that, um, it's already eight o'clock here. Um, All right. So, like I said, I mean, um, 
you know, you should kind of um, review chapter 10 if you if you've done things but about representing numbers in different bases and converting them before. Um, um, and if you haven't done that before, you might want to need to read that a little bit more closely. Um, you know, uh, I, I can give some examples of all of these. So, so I don't know uh, how, I mean, hopefully all these won't be too difficult for, for most people to, to, to do or to figure out, right? So like, for example, the first question we start right off, um, um, actually, this one might be a little bit more complicated than, than any of the others. So most of the others are really concentrating on binary or decimal or hexadecimal, which, you know, you really should know um, hexadecimal and binary and, and being able to convert those for this class and for all the classes in, in uh, computer science. Um, but, you know, the, the, the general principles that we talk about in um, chapter 10 for the 11th edition work no matter whatever what base you know so for example uh this this means that this is five, five four in base eight and then i ask you to convert that to base five right so this is going to be four times eight to the power of zero plus five times eight to the power of one right um and and so probably you know for me i, I wouldn't try to directly convert these from base eight to base five, I, I convert it into decimal using like I just did. And then then once you have the decimal, um, convert that into uh, base five. So, um, so yeah, again, I kind of wish that I had a whiteboard, but um, I'll have to get that set up for next time. So let me just make up like a quick one on these. I don't know if I want to do like examples for all these unless somebody asks specifically about one of those, but, but uh, let me just make up another one. Let, let's say, I don't know, you have 73 um, and this is base, base six, all right? So first of all, let me ask a question. If, if I had people in class here, I'd ask a question. I purposely made a mistake here. Um, can anybody, um, Base three is, is trinary, sure. I mean, binary, trinary. I don't know. I mean, people might have, I don't know if trinary is like an official, the accepted name might be, you know, could talk about quaternary for base four and so on, pentanary for five. Um, so anyway, so I was trying to ask a question. Um, there's actually something wrong with this. So 73 and base six, anybody spot my error already here? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Unmute and shout it out or type in on the chat if anybody wants to try and guess. There's a reason why um, this is nonsensical for me to give you something 73 um, as, a, as a base six here. Yeah, base six doesn't have a seven. So anytime you have base, um, uh, yeah, there's no seven in base six. Exactly correct. Right. So anytime you have a base like six, the valid digits would be zero through five. Right. Uh, and hexadecimal, which is base 16, has digits zero through 15. Right. Although we don't, you know, so, you know, we use decimal, the decimal system, base 10 system um, um, as our natural system. So we actually don't have Arabic digits for 10, 11, 12. So typically when you're using uh, bases above uh, 10, you start using letters from the um, Western alphabet, A, B, C, D. So, I mean, I've seen people do stuff in like base 20. So you have to use A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so on, right? But yeah, anyway here, so it's nonsensical to say this is base six because the only valid digits for a base six number would be zero to five, right? So let's say 53. So 53 base six is five um, times uh, six raised to the one power 
plus uh, three times six raised to the zero power, right? And so that's gonna be equal to, and if I make a mistake on these, which is very easy, um, let me know, shout it out. Um, so I probably better put my chat pin it so it's always on top here, just in case people are asking me questions. Um, yeah, some people gave the answer of what this is in base 10 already. Um, so yeah, that's 30 plus three. So six, six, any, anything raised to the, the zero power is just one. So that's three times one plus five, to, so six to the one is six, so five times six. So that's 33 base 10, right? So um, I use, I usually use carrots um, uh, to represent raising to a power and underscores to represent um, a subscript because this is LaTeX mathematical notation. So just to let you know, when I only have ASCII to do things, um, um, this is a pretty standard convention among computer scientists, things like this. Um, so um, let's say that we wanted to represent this then at ba as base eight, right? But to convert to base eight, um, the, the textbook has a more formal way to do this, to convert something into like a base eight or something. Um, so, but I might real quickly do something like ask, um, um, so I know that I have, uh, yeah, six, three. So somebody's already given me. So, so I know that, um, no, that's not right. Six, three is not right. Um, for example, uh, eight to the power of one. Um, so, so five, three base six is 33 base 10. So I need to ask, so how many eights uh, do I have in here? I, so I don't have any 64. So it's, it's definitely not something with a third digit, like an, uh, an eight to the power of two, right? So there's no 64s, it's less than that. There are some eights. So, so um, uh, um, uh, five is too big. So there, there's four eights. That gets me to 32 and then there's one to the zero, right? Yeah, 43. So, so uh, 41 I got. Did I get that wrong? 41 base eight. So again, I, I could, I'm just doing these on the fly. I could very well make a calculation mistake. Um, somebody shout out here, but yeah, so 43 base eight would be four times eight, which would be 32 plus another three, that'd be 35. Um, so, so yeah, I don't think that's right. So, so 41, so we get four times eight is 32 because that's four times power uh, times eight to the power one plus one times eight to the power of zero. So you get um, 32 plus one or 33 decimal. All right. So that was an example of one of those. If you understand that, I mean, you can do the same thing to, to convert from binary to decimal and uh, decimal to hexadecimal, those kinds of things. So um, maybe we'll, I, 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 I do binary so much, I can do some of these in my head almost. So this one would be pretty easy, right? So there's, there's no zeros on, on pretty significant digits. So this is two to the zero plus two to the one, right? Or three. Uh, oh, I gave you the answer. Is I don't really want to get the answers for those, but, but yeah. So that there's that one. Um, as our textbook probably shows, if I remember from chapter ten, I mean you ought to almost. I mean I probably almost are have the uh, the whole um, first uh, sixteen binary decimal hexadecimal conversions. I uh, remembered personally because I do this stuff so much, you know. So zero 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 binary is um, uh, uh, zero hex, um, which is zero decimal. 
Um, some conventions on this that you might run into. So um, um, and, I, and I might have had this. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to the, the later. We'll get to all these questions here. So. So um, anyway, I thought I had it in this assignment, but maybe not. Maybe I had it in my lecture notes. Um, uh, you might run across in programming languages um, some different conventions. If you want to specify a um, hexadecimal constant versus a, um, um, like a binary constant. So a lot of languages support um, um, that you can directly specify binary constant in the programming language or hexadecimal constants. Um, a pretty common convention is zero B before uh, something that's meant to represent a binary encoded number and zero X for something that's um, a hexadecimal, right? Um, another number system is octal, uh, base eight. So our textbook, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to convert between, um, I'm talking a little bit about the contents of chapter 10 here now. So, the, the, I mean, the reason why hexadecimal and octal are used a lot in computing and technology fields is it's very easy to convert uh, from binary into hexadecimal um, and octal because um, each digit uh, of, of a hexadecimal digit uh, converts to exactly four bits of binary. And each di digit of a octal encoded number uh, converts directly to three bits, okay? Um, but um, I'll come back to that, I'm kind of, Kind of going off on a tangent here, but but yeah, I was about ready to kind of fill out. Um, kind of a basic table of the first 16 numbers encoded as binary uh, hexadecimal and decimal right so, and I won't continue filling all those out, although, of course, once you get to. Um, So one zero 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 is actually um, eight decimal and hexadecimal. And then when you get to this, of course, um, it's not ten hexadecimal; it's, it's a right. Right. This is really only a single hexadecimal digit, so technically I should have just encoded that. Uh, each four bits is a single hexadecimal digit, uh, but it is two decimal digits. So. Anyway, so... Um, So, you know, so it's actually in, in some, well, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So, 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 you know, if anybody wants to, I can maybe give an example of, of, of any of these converting uh, like a hexadecimal to a decimal. Um, so let, let's, let, let me talk just one more thing here and then we'll move on to the question 12 and 13 that people were asking about here. Um, so, The other thing that's talked about in chapter 10 is that um, um, the, 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 the general uh, number system concept um, also can be easily extended to fractional numbers, you know, or numbers with decimal points, or uh, technically we call that, you know, decimal point is for a number encoded in decimal, but we're so used to always using decimal that we just call that a decimal point. But in, in our more general case here, where we might have numbers encoded in binary, you know, base two or hexadecimal, 
Um, we, we might more generally call that the, uh, what is it, the, the radix point instead of the decimal point, right? So it's just the point um, separating the um, um, whole value numbers from the, the, the fractional parts, right? So, you know, real quickly, um, let me just make up, let, let, let's maybe try an example of converting a, a binary number to a decimal that has a fractional part here, right? Something like that, all right? So in this case, you know, um, I, we don't have to worry about zeros on the most significant part. So our first digit that's non-zero for the most significant is here, that's our, um, our two to the one power. So the rest of these then are gonna be fractional or, 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 or um, uh, uh, two raised to negative powers, right? So, so the first digit after the radix point um, is, and we don't have any, but, but that would be, um, oops. Uh, actually representing one half. So two raised to the negative one power is one over two or one half. So you take the reciprocal. Um, if, you know, again, this is stuff I assume that at some point you've learned about in, in a math course somewhere for raising to negative powers. So in this case, you know, we've got uh, one times two plus uh, one times two raised to the negative three. So that's uh, one eighth. Um, or what, point, uh, one, two, five? Yeah, one fourth is 0. 0.25. And uh, so, so, you know, this, this is 0. 0.5. We had no 0.5s, no 0.25s, but we had one 0.125. That, that's the basic idea of converting something with a fractional component. Um, into decimal here, so, so binary with a fraction of them. So, um, questions about that? Yeah, and, and unless anybody wants to ask a specific question about that, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the uh, the last two questions. So all these questions were really kind of things from chapter 10. Um, this stuff is considered so basic, you wouldn't have questions like this on the comprehensive exam, but you might have lots of questions where we have things, you know, uh, values in the problem that are encoded as hexadecimal or binary or something, and we would expect you to know how to, what that representation is and how to use that for calculations and things, so, right? All right, so the last two questions were just um, some, some quick ones from actually from chapter one, our introduction. Um, so um, I might bring up our textbook on that. So um, um, maybe I might skip to chapter, um, to the last question. Both of these are asking you to um, do something using the IAS computer. Um, uh, this defined in chapter one um, from our uh, textbook. So, um, so although, you know, now that I think about this, um, if I have to let me know, um, I, I think some of this IAS stuff might have been added um, in edition 11. So um, this, this particular thing, um, so, so maybe maybe I'll, I'll post um, at least the the figure about what, what the IAS um, instruction set, the, the table one. So I can't remember if he had that in the tenth edition or not. So um, let's look at this one. Uh, I mean, you know, kind of once you understand the the IAS, uh, I'll bring up this table here in a second too. As so once you understand the um, IAS instruction set. Um, 
you can kind of, you know, so in this case, we're disassembling um, the kind of the machine code. And in this case, we're kind of asking you to um, use the IAS um, assembly uh, to write a program here. Right? So again, the, the first thing, I mean, I'm assuming also like for number systems that at some point you've learned about discrete um, math notation, right? So, 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 so notations for like summations and series and things like that, right? So this is a well-known um, kind of a quantity. So, so if you're summing up the values of some sequence, X, one, one, two, three. So this notation, if you don't know what it means, you, you really probably should go and, and uh, do a, a quick, uh, find a quick um, study on, on um, discrete math about summations and things like that. So, so, so the, the sigma here means that we're summing up uh, the values of X, where X is, is changing in, in uh, from one, two, three, four, up to some N that's not specified. So let's say N is five. So that means that we wanna sum up the values one plus two plus three plus four plus five, okay? So that, that's, that's what this notation is saying here. So again, this is LaTeX notation. So, so if I want to know the sum of the values where x equals one to five, uh, what I'm saying is I want to find out the result of taking one plus two plus three plus four plus five. Right. That that's what the um, the summation of the series here. X, so, so this is like writing a loop. So the reason why we often um, um, study or use discrete mathematics and computer science is because these kinds of things translate directly to lots of computer programming idioms. So, so, so the summations are really just a loop over doing some, some calculation over a loop, basically. So, so think of this as, as defining integer x, and x goes from 1 up to n, so 1 up to 5 in my example here. And then we're just taking the sum equals the sum plus x. So, so that's kind of, uh, so I'm kind of right. So like in C or like in Python, so I'll, I'll write some Python code here. So we might declare a variable like sum equals zero. Um, capitalize for me. Um, So if you don't know the range in Python, um, it starts at the first value, it goes up to, but doesn't include the last value. So this will actually create a loop that goes one, two, three, where index is one, two, three, four, five, but not six. Um, so, so once it does one, two, three, four, five, then the loop will be done, right? Uh, this loop does the same thing as the summation um, notation. And, and what's the result of that? It's, it's uh, what, 9, 12, 14, 15. Right. And um, as is shown here, so, so it's pretty easy to prove this, uh, the, the summation of x, where x goes from 1 to n is, is uh, you know, you don't have to actually write a loop. You can just directly calculate what that sum is going to be. It's going to be n times n minus, n, n plus 1 divided by 2, right? So you can check it out. So, so it should be five times six divided by two, which is 30. Um, which is uh, 15. All right. So all that is by way of saying, so what we're saying is uh, you have to look at the app codes um, in table 1.1. Um, and write a program. So first of all, you can do an easy one. So basically all you have to do here is define some variables, but in using this assembly language instead of Python or C um, um, and do the calculation. So you really just need probably like three calculations. Uh, so you have to add, take in, uh, maybe have some other variable that takes in plus, that, that calculates in plus one, and then once you have both of those results, n and n plus one, you have to multiply those, n times n plus one. And then once you have the result, that multiplication maybe saved somewhere, then you have to divide that by two, 
and that would give you the result, right? And then um, for part B, um, you have to do it the hard way, which is you have to actually write a loop. So some of the opcodes in the IAS assembly um, allow you to do jump instructions and things like that. So, you know, you did, so the IAS assembly is not a high level language. So you don't have four statements and things like that. Um, you have to uh, instead do some calculations and then use like a jump to go back and, and, and um, um, basically to uh, implement something like a, a loop in a higher level programming language, but using the instructions given in that table 1.1. 1 .1, so. so let me look at the, um, those instructions here real quickly. So in, in our, um, in our um, textbook, um, the IAS computers talked about in section three for chapter one. So basically every word of memory, so, so the, what the IAS computer has, um, what is it? Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. It has a 40-bit memory for whatever reason. So this is a real old, you know, one of kind of the original kinds of computers here. So it has a 40-bit memory, but um, um, you know that's big enough that um, um, they didn't have that many instructions. So they actually every location in memory. So so what what memory? Uh, this is a question. See if, if anybody knows this. Um, I mean, we talk about this in our textbook. So each location in a modern computer memory um, has how many bits? Does anybody know? So typically for my laptop or the laptop that you have, uh, each memory location, each memory address holds how many bits? We're known as the word size of the memory. Does anybody know? Uh, not quite. So, so uh, you'll often hear computers um, talked about whether they're 32 bit architectures or 64 bit architectures. That has to do with the address space. So, the, uh, the addresses, the, the amount of addressable memory in a 32 bit architecture, the, there's other things that has to do that. And this, this is the kind of stuff also that we'll talk about in this class. But a 32 bit architecture, one of the fundamental things it means is that. Um, we use 32 bits to represent the, 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 the total contents of addressable memory. So that means, again, if you know or understood the stuff like in chapter 10 and the number systems, uh, so like when you have four bits, that means you can represent numbers from 0000, 0, 0, 0 up to 1111. That means that you can represent 16 different unique values, 0 to 15 decimal or two raised to the four, right? So, so the, the, the number of things you can represent with four bits, uh, with, with some number of bits is directly um, related to the number of bits you have to represent it, right? So, so in this case, if I have four bits, I can represent 16 unique values or two to the power of four. Um, if I have a 32-bit architecture, that means I've got uh, I, I can represent addresses in memory that are 32 bits or two to the raise to the power of 32. And that's approximately, uh, what is it, four gigabytes. So yeah, 32 bit computers, if you work out what two to the power of 32 is, um, that's, that's a, a four gigabyte limit. So that means I could have only four gigabytes of memory, four, four gigabytes of addresses that I could store a value in or retrieve the value from, right? And of course, that, that became a bit cramped. So now most computers are 64 bits and I'm kind of skipping a little bit ahead in the course here, uh, which gives a, a substantially bigger potential address space for memory. 
Okay, but back to my original question. So if, if I have um, 32 bit architecture, 64 bit architecture, if I want to like for 32 bits, I might want to ask what's the value at address 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you know, all zeros, one, zero, one, one to get the value in memory address zero, this is what, eight plus uh, two plus one, but, but memory decimal 13, right? So what's the size typically of the values I can store at each memory address in modern computer memory? This is known as the word size of the computer. Nobody knows, nobody wants to hazard a guess. A little bit disappointing. Modern memory, modern computing systems have pretty much um, have pretty much settled on using eight bits as the standard word size for memory. So almost all memories, so, so, so if, if I've got, you know, four gigabytes of addressable memory, but each bucket, uh, each, each location in memory can hold eight bits. Um, and by the way, uh, so, so here's a question. So, so if each bucket of memory holds eight bits, what's the maximum number of things I can represent in a single word of memory? Same thing as I was just doing here. So what is it? Somebody give me the answer on that. You understand what I'm saying? If I have eight bits, so, so when I had four bits, I can, I can represent 16 things. So if I have eight bits, how many things can I represent? How many unique values are there that can be represented with eight bits? Right, that's 10 bits. Two to the power of 10 is 1,024. Two bits of six, right? And, and again, that's because if I have eight bits, I can represent things zero hex. And if you work it out, you know, the, the last thing I can represent is, is that. And that's going to be to the power of eight. Um, I'm sorry, it's going to be two to the power of seven because it's two power of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's going to be two to the power of seven, which is 128. So, so the maximum, the, the minimum value is zero and the maximum value is 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 uh, plus eight plus four plus two plus one. And if you work that out, that's 255. Right. And there's 256 things since we're starting at zero. So, so it's 255 plus one more, the zero thing. So there's 250 unique things, right? And what's the kinds of things that we represented? I, 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 I should probably stop getting off on tangents here, but you know, basically you use that to encode things. So for example, we might encode, um, I, I think something like, like the ASCII code. So um, binary, uh, so, so heck, decimal 64, um, So, so that's 64, because that's two to the power of um, um, six there, right? So uh, we might use that to encode, I can't remember, it, it's close to like a, a, an ASCII A, right? So anytime you have this bit pattern, and if we're interpreting that location in memory as an ASCII character, uh, we would translate or display an A for it, okay? So that's how most stuff works. So that's, again, this, this, this is the kind of stuff that will talk more about um, when we talk about representing numbers and representing other data um, in a computer system, all right? Um, so anyway, I mean, this, this isn't a tangent. This was talked about, I think, in chapter one a little bit. So uh, 
uh, but we'll talk more about it when we talk about memory and the memory hierarchy. But, you know, I always think of memory as just a big array of values that's addressable. Um, um, so, so, so it's really like an array, right? So, um, so like if I had a four bit memory, so if I had a, a four bit um, computer architecture, I could have memory address zero, one, um, two, three and so on up to memory address 15, right? So, so think of these as the indexes into an array, but each one of these addresses then can store eight bits of information if it's using the standard word size that computers um, use nowadays, right? All right, so anyway, we'll talk more about that. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about in this course here. Um, all right, so basically, I mean, first of all, uh, so where's that table here? Here's the table of the opcodes. So you have things like load, store, um, jumps, um, and adds, and multiplies. So, um, so basically, you know, you'll, you'll first want to try and write a program. Um, so, so like, for example, probably you want to use a lot of these kinds of things. So, so you can assume that, um, you've got some values in memory to use as constants. So, so maybe at, um, um, but yeah, so, so you, know, you can assume that your first word of memory, so every word in this memory has 40 bits. So you could say that my memory at address zero holds uh, in, um, which is five, you know? So, so we, we, we would encode five as a, um, as a, uh, as a, uh, what do you call it, as a signed integer here. So we use zero to represent it's a positive number and then the binary pattern for a five magnitude. Um, so that might be at my memory address zero, right? And then, you know, so to get, um, so I might load that value from memory address zero into the accumulator using the load instruction, right? So now when I have in in my accumulator, then maybe I could um, add one to it um, so that now I would have n plus one. So remember, um, to do this first one, to, to do part A, you need to get n and n plus one and you have to multiply those, right? So like if I have n, at address zero, and I load address zero to um, the accumulator. Now I've got in in my accumulator. Now I can do something like say add uh, one to the accumulator. So maybe I have to put constant one at address one in memory, for example, to add one to it. Um, and now I would have like six in my accumulator. Um, and then you want, might want to use for like multiply, so you can multiply five times six. So like multiply multi multiplies um, the memory at some address by MQ, where MQ is um, another register, right? So you might want to load, you know, one of the values into MQ, uh, so, so maybe get six into MQ uh, and add five out in memory just to find that to be at memory zero. And then if you have that, you can use your multiply instruction to multiply five by six, that kind of thing, all right? So I'll leave it up to you. I mean, there's more than one correct way to do that program, um, but, uh, but yeah, you have to read about the IAS instruction set um, and kind of get into 
the mindset of using um, assembly language, assembly level uh, language coding, right? So, but yeah, your basics are you need to get n and n plus one, multiply that, uh, and then get the result of that multiplication into a register, and then use the div to divide by two. Um, and then that would be your result, right? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and post the table 1.1. Um, and then to do the second part here, um, you'll want to do something like I, I, I showed for the Python code. So you want to implement it as a loop. So you want to do basically like compiling from this Python down into the IAS assembly. Right. So you want to have something where you start off with a variable that, that starts off as zero. And then you want to use a jump statement so that you keep adding so, so, that, you, so that you keep adding one. Um, so you need maybe another variable for like your index that starts at one. And then you keep adding this index to the sum uh, and then adding one to the index and then jumping uh, until you get to uh, n, you know, whatever the number of loop times you want to do for the loop there. All right, so I, I think in the um, example solutions that I remember that they did a similar thing for 13. They just kind of uh, assume that uh, you start somewhere in memory, like, like say start in memory at address 088, and then you can use some, like some of those addresses to put in some of those constants that you might need for your program, like for in and your index and things like that. So, so for, for question 12, then we need to kind of look these up. So remember, um, the um, this is in hexadecimal notation, so you're gonna have to translate this. Uh, but um, the um, uh, each one of these represents, uh, you know, so so each hexadecimal digit represents four binary digits, right? So basically, uh, the first five digits um, is gonna represent. 20 bits, or the, 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 the rightmost five digits represents the, the 20 bits for, um, for the right instruction, right? So, so since every hexadecimal digit is um, um, four bits, if I have five hexadecimal digits, I have 20 bits. So, so that's gonna be representing the bits here, where the, um, you know, the, um, the last three digits are the address bits. So you'd have to translate that to an address. So again, now these three digits represent an address, zero FB here. And then these two digits represent um, the um, opcode, right? So, so the opcode is eight bits or two hexadecimal digits. Right? And you should be able to look those up in here. So, so um, you know, two, one, Hexadecimal is, you know, 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 binary, because I, I can trans I can directly translate two into the binary, 0, 0, 1, 0, and one into the binary, 0, 0, 0, 1. And um, we should be able to find that in the table. Um, So yeah, there's the first one, I think. So 0010 is two, 0001 is one, right? So kind of as a hint, or maybe as a first step for the problem 12, you might wanna just go ahead and convert all these into hexadecimal because that'll, that'll more easily, you'll be able to more easily then directly look up um, the opcode um, in the, um, In the um, the contents here, as long as you get the right 
two digits that represent the app code bit versus the, the right three digits that represent the memory. All right, so you get yeah, another one. So that is op code is going to be in hexadecimal, it's going to be zero. And then 1010 is two to the four plus two to the two. So that's uh, 10 uh, or A. Um, so that's zero A is this op code here. Two to the three. Did I say two to the four? Two, two to the three, eight plus uh, two to the one, two. All right. Will that get you going? Any questions on that? Yeah, I'll post this. So I had, hadn't thought about it. I had forgotten about that. But um, now that I think about that more, that, that was one of the things that he maybe added in um, the 11th edition here. So, so yeah, you might not have the section. I'll go check my 10th edition. I can't remember. So whether he had this this IAS computer discussion or not. All right, um, I'm, I'm thinking about transitioning away from the assignment. Um, Unless people have some more questions they want to ask about some things. So normally at this point on these class sessions, you know, um, I probably, you know, I, I, yeah, I'll probably start by seeing if there's any questions about the assignment that's due on Friday, but I would also probably go over the solutions real quickly and see if anybody you know, uh, didn't understand or wants to disagree with the solution. So yeah, next week, um, one thing I would do kind of at this point, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the, the, um, the solutions uh, for this assignment one. Um, and I might also, I don't know, you know, talk a little bit more of a traditional kind of lecture thing. I don't think I'm going to do it today. I'm already kind of ready to go. But um, um, let me see if there's anything. We, we did cover quite a bit of the stuff. I think we probably, probably touched on most everything um, that I have in my notes on the, uh, the number system. Yeah, here's what I was trying to remember. So um, just something handy to know that um, um, there are conventions. Um, so in, in a lot of programming languages, um, they have conventions for being able to represent things in bases other than decimal, right? So it's pretty common that zero X is used in many languages for hexadecimal numbers. Um, and, and uh, not, not quite as common, but a lot of languages are starting to use 0B for binary um, and 0O for octal constants. Um, and I have the, the whole table here on uh, converting um, decimal to binary to hexadecimal. So yeah, and, and, and right, if you have eight bits, you know, the biggest number they can represent is 255. So there's actually 256 things you can represent in, in base six. And then as soon as you want to represent more than 256 things, you're going to need uh, more than eight bits. Uh, so 256 is uh, uh, is eight bits of zeros with a one on the, the ninth bit, uh, or zero x one zero uh, one zero zero uh, hexadecimal.
Um, so yeah, I probably mostly talked about structure today. Yeah, so, so yeah, you do need to understand. Um, these are the four main components of, of a system and then we'll talk about all these in this course. Actually, we won't talk, well, we'll talk a little bit about IO devices, so mostly hard drives and things. But we'll spend, concentrate mostly on like CPU and memory, um, uh, less so on IO devices and the system cut, system interconnect or the bus. So, um, we will be using um, our specific example, examples. We usually use the uh, x86, Intel x86, when we want to talk specifics about a computer architecture. Um, and we often contrast that with um, the ARM uh, architecture processors, okay? So um, if you don't know what complex instruction set computer versus reduced instruction set computer is, that's one of the things that after taking this course, you ought to understand what the difference is between those. So um, we have a whole chapter on risk, one of our last chapters. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap up here. Um, I think that's most of the stuff that I want to cover. Like I said, I'm, I'm mostly just want to concentrate on, you know, like assignments and problems on these classes. I, I will kind of go through lecture notes if people uh, prompt me or ask me, you know, um, or if people want to ask questions about a particular thing. Um, on these sessions that they didn't understand or would like more information about, I'd be happy to try and talk more about those things. But but I mostly do want to kind of do problems, talk about the assignments and things. So. Any final questions? I'll get that that IAS assembly language table posted here on DTOL, try and do that. Uh, this video looks like I got a good recording, so I will post that as well on our YouTube playlist. Um, I didn't have anybody show up for face-to-face, -face, which like I said, is fine with me. Um, I'm, um, I will probably be face-to-face -face next Wednesday, but um, um, uh, going forward, I will ask people to let me know um, if you think that you are going to be taking, um, you know, might want to come in um, to the classroom and do these face to face. Uh, if if um, if I continue to, to see that I have 100 percent of people um, are fine or would you know want to do it over Zoom, um, I might start just doing these from. A different location, okay. Uh, so I, I will be in the classroom. Um, um, if if anybody wants uh, to do these on face to face, uh, but you know, let me know. Um, um, I'll, I'll probably be here at least next week, and then we'll see if I get any requests um, to continue being doing the face to face ones or not. So. All right. Uh, last chance for questions. Otherwise, I'm going to end the session uh, and get this stuff posted here. All right. Have a good evening. Uh, send me questions by email if you need to. Make certain you get your assignment one um, in by the due date. So, and I will see you guys next week and talk to you. Um, over chat and stuff.